Um, I'm going to, to basically look at the science behind this technology, um, but I'm also, while still talking a lot about geochemistry, uh, mining geology and exploration, I'm going to bring in some aspects of other areas where we uh, we are at the forefront of technology sourcing back material to its origin. Now, obviously, this can be applied to uh, mining geology and geochemistry as well as these other areas. So I'll build a picture around the kind of things that we do, um, why the technology which we term HALO, <clears throat> why it exists, what it does, where it is um, most efficient, where it's uh, basically used, and what the future of that technology can be. When we started this work 20 years ago, or actually more than 20, nearly 30 years ago, um, it was becoming more and more apparent that the occurrence of surface expression of all bodies was getting less and less, and that there would be a requirement very soon for looking at more deeply buried all bodies, and all bodies that were in fact blind. Uh, to surface expression in blind, to a certain extent, to geochemistry as well. Um, so what we wanted to try and do those, in those days was to improve the technology, improve the detection limits of half binary elements, elements that were associated with mineralization. Um, and that was really quite possible because then what was coming in were, were the techniques of uh, uh, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. And those techniques gave us probably at that stage, 30 years ago, 100 times, up to 1,000 times better sensitivity for a large range of trace elements than was currently available in those days. Uh, since then, the detection limits have decreased by, oh, well over, um, sorry, by well over 1,000 times. So we've even got much better detection limits now. So we wanted to improve the detection limits. We wanted to improve the depth to which we could penetrate the surface. We thought that probably the first, say, 60 meters of the soil was being uh, penetrated by conventional geochemistry then, uh, and we wanted to go certainly below 100 meters. Uh, we needed to look at producing better anomaly to background ratios. Key to exploration pretty much is that uh, if you can improve the, the anomaly to background ratio, it, it doesn't really matter what the low detection limits are, because they are below what a geologist would normally think was significant. But if the background or the anomaly to background ratios were high, then it would indicate something taking place in that area and would uh, point towards the possibility of mineralization. And then, of course, this technology had to be fast, it had to be cost effective, um, because it's no good developing a technology that's fantastic and it's going to cost you three or four hundred dollars per sample. It just doesn't work for the mining industry, which is a conservative industry. Now, as we move to the next slide, um, my trusty stalwart uh, Nathan is doing the slides for me, which is very kind of him. We started this work out in the United States and we were looking at. Um, the possibility of finding buried uh, base metal ore deposits or base metal deposits below sandy overburden. Um, and while I'm, I'm just going to give you some back, the background now to explain how we got there, where we came from, what we were doing, um, our deepest that we were able to find um, copper and zinc deposits in the United States was 165 meters below the surface, and it had no surface expression, and it was in a sand clay environment. So we were extremely um, heartened by the fact that we were penetrating this far down. And we knew it was this far down because subsequent to us looking at it, finding an outlining and anomaly, it was drilled and the ore body was in fact there. So this was, this was very, uh, very positive. We were competing at that stage with selective leaching technology and of course conventional geochemistry. And I would point out that if your ore body has a surface expression, obviously there's no need to go to a more sophisticated technique. But as I mentioned right at the beginning, surface expression of these ore bodies is becoming less and less and less 
We're not seeing them, we're not being able to find them because the anomalies are back that ratio is poor. And therefore, I believe that we need techniques like this. And I will tell you during the course of the, uh, this um, discussion uh, just where it differs from conventional geochemistry and from leaching technology. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Um, the technology is driven by uh, essentially looking at very sophisticated instrumentation. Our present generation of instruments that we use in a couple of mass spectrometry and emission spectroscopy. Both of these techniques have had a, uh, a resurgence in their detection because of because of computers and because of electronics. Um, in our ICT MSs, we are now able to get down to sub parts per billion detection limits. Um, and this obviously not only looks at a single element with those very low concentrations, but also looks at associations of elements. So our technology is not limited to looking for, say, copper lid and zinc if you're trying to find the copper lid zinc deposit. We look at some 62 to 65 elements using both ICTMS and ICTAES and combine the results of these two techniques into a, a database, which is a, a double database in a way, because what it does is allow us to look at single elements or multiple elements, but look at elemental associations as well. I'll mention this later on, but many of these elemental associations allow us to uh, define the type, the style of mineralization, and get some idea of what the ore fluids are that have been placed that mineralizing, mineralizing event. Um, and on the basis of that, this technique can be used not only for looking for uh, buried and blind ore bodies, but also for identifying their characteristic elemental association patterns. And because of that, finding or using this as an exploration tool as well, whether we can look at um, just an association pattern saying this is the style of mineralization, so therefore we're looking for this type of mineralization in a particular area, or whether when we are looking at um, basic deposits in the case of gold um, and looking at the gold itself to say, okay, this, this gold is actually the result of a mineralizing event. But over here in the same place in deposit, we have gold that is associated with the second um, emplacement event. So we probably have two sources here. And instead of then giving up having found a place in deposit, possibly where it comes from, we would go on looking for another deposit, uh, another area that is mineralized. And this has been used uh, in a number of countries uh, where we have been able to say to exploring companies, yeah, your, your, um, your nugget of gold actually is from two or three different uh, emplacement events and for letting them go and find the second or third uh, event itself and, and explore, for, uh, explore for that and beneficiate that. The rapid result side of it is important in that we traditionally, I guess, um, you could be taking a, a major sample, a couple of kilograms, two kilograms of sample, and sending them somewhere, having that sample drive, disaggregate, seal, and a subsample taken. We use approximately half a gram of material for our analysis, but a half a gram of minus 80 mesh fraction. Uh, so it is a representative sample. And these samples could be, if you want to, produced in the field, and a large number of samples sent as one, two, three grams of material, sieve ready for analysis to us, so that once we have them in the laboratory, if you've flown in cheaply, uh, once we have them in the laboratory, or we can then analyze them to give you quickly and give you more results back with a two-week two period, um, and you'd still be on site in the field. It wouldn't have to be uh, the result of bringing all the samples back into, uh, into a central facility, having them analyzed, and maybe six months, three months later, getting data out right, that you would possibly have used the next season. These could be Rapid turnaround so that you have the results, but it's honestly very quick. Thanks, Nick. Um, the instrumentation, uh, yes, is, uh, is highly sophisticated. Uh, we have 
pre-ICP MSs at the moment and are getting more, um, they are obviously used not only for, for our neurological work, for our mining related work, but other areas as well. Um, we have associated with them lasers that we can do mineralogical analysis as well. And I'll come on to that a little bit later. So as I mentioned earlier, um, from about uh, a maximum of 60 meters of conventional geochemistry, we can go down certainly well over 100 meters. And this opens up a whole new range of potential deposits to be able to find. We're looking at over 60 elements. Um, so this means that we, if we are looking for, for example, a company that goes out and wants to explore the gold, um, but we also find base metal deposits, we find paper type deposits, we can find nickel, we find trouble, things like that. Um, other than the gold that we're looking for in the uh, far side the elements associated with that, we will tell that company that there is an anomaly associated with this kind of mineralization. We also have um, uh, a positive number of elements to look at, in fact, we're using two techniques to be able to determine them, a technology for looking for timberlites as well. So this is a, a multifaceted approach, not just looking for a single type of deposit. You're not sending into a company saying, okay, fine, we'd like to analyze the following five elements. You get six to know it, uh, and uh, we also help you interpret the data so which you can say and what that interpretation is. We can assist you in um, looking at that data and interpreting that data until you get a handle on uh, what you're doing and how you do it. Thank you. So, this is a um, please forgive me. Um, this is a little cartoon of, uh, of what it really looks like, what we mean by halo. Um, now, halo actually, most geochemists will recognize the term halo to see the sort of uh, distribution of. Oh, I think we're. Oh. Sorry? We we'll lost and, you for a minute there, John, but you're back now. It's good. Oh, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, halo, uh, have you got me now? Am I still there? I hope. <laughs> yes, it's good. It's good now. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Thank yeah. you. Halo is uh, short for hydromorphic anomaly location um, of all bodies. And what we're trying to do here, and if you look at this slide that you've got in front of you now, um, the all body at the base of the bottom left of the screen is going to be leached by juvenile solutions, by solutions coming up through rocks, through soil, and by transpiration, rapid transpiration down to the surface. Those um, solutions leach elements from the ore body and from the surrounding rocks, travel to the surface and evaporate at the surface, forming annular rings around soil particles. Um, now that is a direct indication of what's pretty much underneath um, the area that you're sampling. The lateral transmission, the lateral migration of those uh, solutions is relatively small, um, but uh, what we're playing with is uh, there are other things that will migrate those solutions around. There are other things to take those solutions and push them somewhere else. Uh, but essentially, these solutions from the ore body are being taken to the surface by vertical transpiration. They can be picked up by trees, um, and that is the conventional, uh, if you like, uh, biogeochemistry where you're looking at leaves. We have I, I, I have another technique which we use where we actually interact lasers with a particular portion of the leaf and can uh, look at uh, the emplacement of a of mineralization, the emplacement of elements in the root system of the plants um, above, above hanging water samples. That's subject for another discussion. Um, these solutions leak the material into the soil, the soil um, is exposed to the weather where evaporation takes place and a buildup of these annular rings, rather like free rings, takes place on the surface of the particle. Um, these rings are picometer to nanometer distance uh, thick. They are not thick at all. So what we want to be able to do, if we could, is to leach only the hydromorphically in place anomaly, the hydromorphically in place solution. If we start leaching too much else, we're getting uh, an incorporation of background, and the background may dull that anomaly to the point that you just can't see it and distinguish it from background. 
In addition to that, I mean, rain um, falling, falling onto the ground will leach into the soil, and there is circulation building up and leaching and air and evaporation of the bacteria as well. So what we're interested in is taking surface soil samples, relatively surface, literally we are, we are engaged tens of 30 centimeters below the surface and taking that sample, obtaining a minus 18 mesh fraction and reacting it, I will come on to that in a moment, uh, with uh, how we perform, how we perform halo. Uh, so conventional geochemistry uh, obviously needs, we think, more sample, it's less sensitive. Um, with these samples, it is, it is much more sensitive to be able to distinguish the, uh, the anomaly to background ratio because what we are removing is the surface hydromorphically in place anomaly um, and not anything to do with the particle that is associated with that anomaly. The particle, in fact, is just a carrying device for the hydromorphically in place anomaly. So therefore, the background is very, very much lower. And the ability to see the anomaly to background ratio is much, much better. Okay. okay, in more detail, um, essentially, simplistically, this is what is happening. Um, away from the ore body, you are not entraining any material from the ore body. Um, and the material that comes to the surface represents the background of that soil, or the background of that sequence. I beg your pardon. Um, material above the ore body is being leached, the ore body is being incorporated and taken to the surface. So you're picking your anomaly up in this area, and over the other side, you've lost your anomaly again because you're outside the ore body. That is simplistic. I fully realize that. That basically is the principle. And if we look at and, and if, uh, representation of the soil particle. On the surface of that soil particle is a hydromorphically imposed anomaly, and that's what we're targeting. So, and the next uh, one is these measures. So what this does um, is, and we've got here, we are comparing halo with a chemical leach and with conventional geochemistry. The backgrounds, um, Usually in these techniques, they are low. We can assume them to be relatively low, but when you run a conventional geochemistry technique and you dissolve the sample, uh, or pretty much dissolve the sample, you may use a four acid attack, three acid attack, or something like that. Over a buried ore body, the anomaly is always suppressed. You can't see it. That's what the whole idea of buried and blind mineralization is. It doesn't produce an anomaly at the surface or a very good one. So, as you can see with the black line going through here, it's difficult. It would be difficult. And this is an actual example, a real example. It's difficult to see any imposition of what represents the ore body in the area associated with soil above the ore body. Selective leaching, chemical leaching, probably a little bit better, yes. Um, but because it's still a wet chemical technique, um, the, the solutions indurate pictures and fractures and porosity um, holes in the, um, in the sample um, and will incorporate some of the material that is the original rock, the original soil, into the solution that you finally are analyzing. And what we have here is an example of halo. This is a single element, but you can do exactly the same plots for all of the elements. You can do mathematics on those plots be able to augment that anomaly even further. Um, but we are producing a bacterium um, that is sitting on the surface of that particle and leaching into its sheet, the sheet that surrounds this bacterium, um, trace metals from the hydromorphic anomaly and not only the hydromorphic anomaly as it goes searching for energy um, from the, uh, the, the grain itself. The animal is sitting on the grain is leaching that grain, but it's not putting its body or any of its chemicals into uh, the uh, grain fissures and fractures that are present. It is simply leaching that hydrophobic anomaly from the sample. So after a period of time, um, we uh, take the bacteria, remove the bacteria, uh, analyze that solution, and get a very good background to anomaly ratio, sorry, anomaly to background ratio, and over the top of the ore body.
Okay. Um, um, I think, Nathan, you are speaking to this for the moment, um, I believe. So, but if not, let me go on a little, little bit further into this one. Yeah, still, still you, John. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, a summary of this, of this technology here is that uh, if you look at this bar graph, with the halo technology, the proportion of the um, material that the soil cells need and where it, where the soil where that comes from, where the elements come from in that cell, relatively a significant amount, much more than 80% of that material is coming from the surface imposed hydrowater anomaly. It's an indication of the current situation of that soil. It's an indication of what the soil um, is carrying in the solution uh, and what it's carrying in the solution from the sub, uh, subcropping all bodies and buried and blind in the Only a small percentage is coming from the uh, grain itself. This is the indication underneath there. There's something that proportionately, <clears throat> because we're looking only at the uh, Hydrowalky anomaly, mainly the hydrowalky anomaly, the anomaly to background ratio is significantly higher. Proportion in chemical leach it is less, probably something like a 30 to 70 percent in the chemical leach is coming from the hydrowalky anomaly, about 30 percent or about 70 percent of the rock. So it suppresses the anomaly itself and it's more difficult to see. And in conventional geochemistry, again, a lot less, more to do with taking the actual soil particles into the solution. And therefore, buried and blind deposits do not contribute significantly or as much as they could to look at this. They don't uh, contribute as much as they could to the actual chemical composition of the solution that are representing and looking for the buried and blind or Now, finally, I think finally, sorry, um, we can plot these solutions, uh, the, the chemical elements in these solutions, up in a series of uh, X, Y, Z plots, um, false color plots, and what have you. And here is a, an example of what we looked at for uh, <clears throat> both gold and molybdenum over a particular deposit. Um, along here, you can see the red areas. These are highs um, of gold and equivalent highs for molybdenum that sit on top of these deposits, as you can see on top of these anomalies. The principle here is obviously that there's pretty much no such thing as a monomineralic ore body. Uh, yes, you're looking for gold ore, but you're going to find copper, zinc, lead, silver, thallium, uh, uh, tantalum. You're going to find a number of other elements that are present there. You're not going to just find gold. And it's exactly the same uh, with our technology. Because our bugs cannot distinguish between the elements that they are picking up. And they're pulling these from just the entire hydrogen anomaly. They can't distinguish between them. Um, they are pulling up everything, and therefore they are picking up a multi element anomaly. So we can use trivially a product analysis or a sum analysis of the trace numbers of there to enhance the anomaly, or we can do some more fancy chemometrics um, to enhance that anomaly. And we've recently written a couple of papers um, where we have looked at using some fairly fancy statistics and metrics to find and look at deep buried ore bodies. And we are developing this technology even more now to be able to identify. This is the kind of thing that will be picked up from ore bodies that are over 100 meters below the surface. And you can see radiations, you can see multi-element technology, um, which improve and make you feel a lot better about finding mineralization, because if it's above the element anomaly and the element is sensible, the likelihood is that you're going to find mineralization under the surface. Um, and that, is, that mineralization, in any case, has been completely sterile to conventional geochemistry. We reckon that about 60% of Australia, um, for example, is sterile to conventional geochemistry. Um, and that opens up a huge area where we can use these techniques for for very wide. Okay, now I will hand over to you. Excellent. Thanks, John. Um, uh